My job today is to break your patterns by sharing stories from the private sector and show you how much different they are to what you hear in the public sector. And when I did my presentation and I'm watching the first two presenters, I suddenly realised that I'm not going to break a lot of patterns because what happens in the private sector is far more aligned to what happens in the public sector than you can imagine. So some of the things I'm going to talk about today, you're going to go, duh, we're doing that anyway. Um, it's because everybody is doing it. So that's my job, is to try to break your patterns. I'm asking a favour of you as well. It's because I came prepared with post-it notes. <laughs> and at the end of my presentation, during questions, Abby has volunteered to hand out the post-it notes. And I'm just asking everybody to write on the post-it note, what's their most powerful insight from this morning? What's their takeaway? Because on the slide, you can see, at the front there, you can see if a picture's worth a thousand words, then an insight is worth a thousand pictures. And what we'd like to find out is what is your insight? What is something that you've learnt today that you didn't know when you came in? That's the first question. And there's another question I want to get you to answer and I'll show, show you during the um, presentation. So I'm the Executive Director of the Hargraves Institute. We are a group of large organisations, both public and private, that are dedicated to success through innovation. Leaders in our members join Hargraves because they want to be more successful. Their organisations want to be more successful and they believe that innovation is a way to do it. And what they predominantly believe is that they can't do it themselves, so let's collaborate and learn from other people. So Hargraves is your innovation community. And I'm going to share some stories about Hargraves um, today. I have the absolute pleasure to teach elephants how to dance. My whole working life for the last 15 years is dealing in large organisations, whether they're public or private, to teach them how to be more innovative. And I've probably learnt more from them than they've learnt from me, and that's how I teach elephants how to dance. And so these are some of the large organisations we've dealt with. Some of the public sector ones are shown there. Um, currently we're doing adaptive leadership for New South Wales Health. Um, they've got the largest design program that I know in the country, and we've been very fortunate to help New South Wales Health do that. Uh, the New South Wales Public Service Commissioner um, is dedicated to innovation in the public service up there, and, uh, and we're helping them. But I just wanted to highlight one here, just as a, a sort of show, showing my background a bit in the public sector, is the Victorian uh, Treasury and Finance uh, started an innovation initiative, and they came up with the Yellow Brick Road as their innovation process. And as you can see, the innovation process, exactly as we've heard before, starts with identifying a problem or an opportunity, defining what it is, exploring what it is, generating the ideas, designing the solutions and prototyping, and implementing the solutions. What we also did um, at that particular time was we produced these information posters. And it was the first time anybody stuck a poster behind the toilet door. And so these were put through every toilet in the Victorian Department of Treasury and Finance um, in Spring Street. Um, lots of different thoughts, lots of different posters. And it was interesting because we didn't think anyone was reading them. So after about five or six weeks, we didn't change them. We changed them every week. And then one week we didn't change them and we got an awful lot of complaints <laughs> because we were discovering that everybody was reading them. Okay, and these are absolutely fantastic. The issue with this is that we did this in 2003. And so some organisations have been on this innovation journey for decades. And if you ask the Department of Treasury and Finance in Victoria, are they more innovative today than they were then? I'd love to ask that question um, because lots of change has happened in the meantime. But this is the sort of stuff that was, was happening 10 years ago. And what I want to show you is some of the things that have happened over the last 20 years ago, last 20 years and 30 years, etc. What I want you to do, though, is don't think like public servants for the next 45 minutes. We do not see things as they are, we see things as we are. And I'm going to use different words, and I'm going to give you different examples, and I don't want you to immediately go, oh no, that's not a public service, I can't learn, learn from that. I just want you to sit back for a sec and say, what can I learn from that? Oh, he used that word, that's wrong, I'd use this word. That's okay, right? I just want you to look at what, what are the insights and what are the learnings, because lots of things have changed. And um, what I want to do is then help you define what does success look like? Because all my members want to be successful and innovation is a tool. Being innovative is not the goal. Being successful is the goal. 
And whether it's you as an individual in your career, whether it's your team, whether it's your organisation, the goal is success and how you define it. And this is a lovely diagram, that I, lovely saying that I always put up. Um, insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. Everybody's heard that? Dear Albert said that 70 years ago. And my presentation is based around this quote, which I say is that insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting the same results. And the reason I say that is because the world is changing so fast that if you stand still or if you do the same thing you did yesterday, you're going backwards. And that's the difference between 2014 and 1954 is that in 1954, the world wasn't changing as fast as it is today. If you are not changing, you are going backwards. And if you like that diagram, I've actually brought down little cards. And if you want to connect with me, because I'm addicted to LinkedIn and all that sort of stuff, grab a card. Um, that's the message. And it happens very, very quietly. Have you ever sat at a set of traffic lights and suddenly you put your foot harder on the brake because you felt like you were rolling backwards and you weren't? The car beside you was taking off, right? That's what's happening in the world today, is if you are not moving forward, then you are moving backwards. And that's the big, big issue. And so when I started my career, so I have zero experience working in the public sector. I'm a mechanical engineer. I spent 20 years in the automotive industry from 1980 to 1999. I worked it out that the automotive industry in Australia was dead. And I got out 10 years before the car companies realised it was dead and changed careers. In that time, every car in, manufactured in Australia from about 1985 to 2012, I think the last one was, had a part in it that I helped innovate. I was an expert in carpets and acoustics and things like that. I'm not an expert in the public sector. And when I started my career, this was the company that we idolised. We went to seminars on how to be like Kodak. And it was the leading company. And we all remember Kodak. Best quality, correct. Great product, correct. They actually had a great price and a great productivity. They even invented the product that put them out of business. People, and the comments before about change fatigue. You know, people get change fatigue and churn fatigue and all that sort of stuff. Guys, the world is changing, whether you get fatigued or not. The world is changing. So, in Australia's top 100 companies since 1990, 70% are no longer in Australia's top 100 companies. They got pushed out of the way by other more successful companies. They didn't disappear. They were just pushed out of the way by 70 other companies. And that's what happens over a period of time. And that's what change is all about. This guy, as you've heard, and I've got stories about Steve Jobs as well, um, in my presentation, you can't do an innovation presentation without Steve Jobs. This guy went from being bankrupt to being the biggest company in the world. This guy, ever heard of ResMed, Australian company, medical device company, helps you sleep, produces sleep masks, so if you've got sleep apnea, etc., wasn't even invented in 1990 and is now a $3 billion company. And this is a company that I've had a lot of experience with and we'll talk about a little bit about it. This guy, was a trading company in 1935 and is now growing faster than Apple. And I'm going to share with you what I believe that the secrets of going forward are because I've been very, very fortunate. I've spent 10 years working with people that, uh, in teams that are working with Samsung. So what does successful innovation look like? And this is the biggest similarity and the first presentation from John today. He got it so right. I'm going to use the same thing, which is an example around um, IT and computers. Has everyone heard of Moore's Law? Yes. Yeah? The power of a computer doubles every 18 months or the price halves every 18 months. It was invented by Moore in 1963, who was the managing director of Intel. He just noticed it one day in a bunch of magazines and said, oh, cool, look at that. And he wrote about it and then suddenly became Moore's Law. It is exponential growth. And this is the power of computing from 1900 through to today. And that's a logarithmic scale that starts off at 10 to the power of zero is one, I think. And then you've got 10,000, and then you get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. This is the history of computing over the same period. And, we, and do you remember the names of those computers? The old Pentium, right? And the quad core, etc. the old compacts, etc. 
why does computing grow exponentially? And the answer is very simply, simple. When they invent a faster computer chip, they put it in the computer that invents the next computer chip, that goes into the computer that invents the next computer chip. Every incremental advance that they make in computing power builds on top of itself. It doesn't go in different directions. So the power of computing since 1900 has grown exponentially because every little incremental um, improvement has grown on top of itself. Incremental innovation is the way to be successful, not disruptive innovation. You can get away with disruptive innovation, and there's lots of good examples of it, if you want to create a sustainable, long-term, innovative organisation to be successful, incremental innovation is the way to do it. This is the theory, in incremental innovation versus, um, so linear growth versus exponential growth. Do you notice how in the first two or three or four years it's about basically the same? And then suddenly it kicks off? Because everything you do builds on itself. Here's the Apple share price from 1993 through to 2013, when they're the largest company in the world. They were basically bankrupt in 1993. Can you see the exponential growth, how nothing happened? Now, there's two theories that you have to learn from this. First one is, is if you wear the same jeans, shirt and shoes for 10 years, you'll be incredibly successful. <laughs> the second one was the comment about resources that was raised before. They were broke in 1993. They had no money for 10 years. Now they may be incredibly rich. Back then, when they did the core innovation that delivered the future, they had no money because they were broke. They came that close to closing down. The biggest restriction that I perceive in innovation in Australia and the public sector and the private sector is the fact that there is a CEO between 1998 and 2010, one CEO, one vision. If you look around Australia at either public sector organisations or private sector organisations that have had one CEO for that amount of time, they're very few. When you do find them, they happen to be incredibly successful. Singular vision, incremental change, Gal Kelly at Westpac, Coca-Cola, ResMeds had the same CEO for 20 years, Cochlear, the organisations we all think about, they've had consistent leadership. And that's something that because of the churn of politics and things like that, that's not as, as evident in the public, um, public sector. Here's the share price of ResMed, same period, a local example. Here's the difference between iTunes and Amazon, which is why iTunes is a gobbusting success and Amazon has never made a profit, ever. And the comment we had before about being in business for 10 years and not making a product, not making a profit, if you're doing disruptive innovation, that's what happens. I was very fortunate I was involved in one of the world's most leading breakthrough innovations of all time, which was the squeezy tomato sauce bottle. Do you guys remember that? The, the, the master foods bottle? Before that it was glass, and they, they recognised that there was a consumer problem, which was people hated the glugginess around the top of a glass bottle, so let's invent a new bottle. Right? That bottle took four years to invent and they didn't make a profit for ten years because it was a disruptive innovation and it was a squeezy tomato sauce bottle. Right? I've got a whole lecture on how to innovate around a squeezy tomato sauce bottle. <laughs> Samsung is the new hero, okay? So this shows you the Apple price, share price in blue, Samsung in red. However, when you have, that's over the longer term. In the short term, if you have a look on the bottom graph, in October 2012, if you sold your million dollars worth of Apple shares, which we all have, and bought a million dollars worth of Samsung shares, today you'd be nearly 50% ahead. Apple's dying and doesn't know it yet, and Samsung's taking it. How many people here have an Apple phone? Tell the truth, hands down. How many people here have a Samsung phone? Tell the truth. Now keep your hands up, Mr. Samsungers, Mr. and Mrs. Samsungers, if you had an Apple phone before you had a Samsung phone. Right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, that's why Apple's dying. Because when you get incremental change of people moving from your blockbuster product to the next blockbuster product, you're slowly losing your profitability, which is your biggest issue. And that's what Apple are trying to fight at the moment. Okay, and Sam's... Samsung is now Apple. Sorry? Does anyone have Samsung phones now Apple 
Oh, question. Does anyone have a Samsung phone now bought an Apple phone? One, two. That's called churn. Right? <laughs> Sorry? A be oh, I'm not going to go there. Um, what that's called is competitive tension, right? I'm trying to steal your market share, you're trying to steal my market share. What's the first thing we learned about when we worked with Samsung? The best way to innovate is to copy your competitors. Did they copy their competitors? Absolutely. Did they get caught copying their pet competitors? Absolutely. Did it cost them $250 million? Absolutely. And the day they got caught for $250 million, their share price went up over two and a half billion. Because everyone said, hey, I can buy a Samsung, it's the same as an Apple. And it's got extra bits. And it's cheaper. Right? So, here's the thing that's happening at the moment. You see Apple's profitability is coming back down and, and Samsung's profitability is growing. And this is the reason why, and we all know it. You know, remember the old Nokia? Anyone have had Nokia? <coughs> had one? Does anyone still have one? <laughs> what about a. Uh, you wouldn't have Blackberries, would you? Blackberry? Because you were forced to have a BlackBerry. Yeah. Have you got a BlackBerry now? No. Yes, you do. Over here. Departmental giving you the Blackberries. Can't change because of security. Yep. <laughs> Their point of difference is security. Um, but have a look what's happening with Apple and then obviously what's happening with Samsung. The reason why I use these examples is because they happen so fast. It's easy to put a graph up and say, hey, look at this. And you go, wow, cool. What does it mean to you, though? What it means is the world is changing faster now than it ever has unless you change fast, you will become redundant. Average age in the room here, with me included, is about 29, right? <laughs> <laughs> Means you're probably going to be working for another 30 or 40 years. How much change is going to happen in the next 30 or 40 years? Was anyone in the workforce when they got the first mobile phone? H hands down, anyone in the workforce when they got a first fax machine? Showing their age, aren't you? Anyone in the workforce when they got their first PC? Right? What's going to happen in the next 20 or 30 years is the big question. So my message is exactly the same as John's, John's message is from little things, big things grow. If you want to become successful, focus on doing lots of little things that happen to align, that happen to build on each other. The way you get up a staircase is lots of little steps, but they all happen to go in the one direction. So what is needed for success? What do you have to do? Here's our definition, um, very simply, implementing ideas that add value. I don't care how sexy they are, how creative they are, I don't care how hard they are, I don't care whether it's brilliant implementation, as long as you implement ideas that add value. Whether you want to be entrepreneurial or inventive, I'll leave that to you. If you want to be entrepreneurial, the difference is give up your job, go home, start a business in your garage, you only have to argue with your partner. If you want to be innovative inside a large corporate or a large organisation, you've, you've got to argue with a lot of people, don't you? Here's our process of innovation. People with insights generate ideas and implement them. Is everyone happy with that? They're playing cards. What's the most important playing card? I need a volunteer to yell out the most important playing card. Say it again. <laughs> of those four. <laughs> They're quick. Implementation. Implementation. Yes, nearly. Um. What's the most important playing card? Individual. People. Innovation starts with people, number one. Number two, implementation. What's the next most important player card? People are first, implementation second. What's number three? Insight. Insight, because unless you know where you're going and what's happening, there's no point. The last thing and the least most important thing in the world of innovation is ideas. Ideas are a dime a dozen. I could run a brainstorming session with you guys in the next five minutes and come up with a thousand ideas. Ideas are not important. They're a commodity. It's implementation, it's people, it's insights that drive innovation. So the four parts to success are, and this is my terminology, innovation 1.0 is brainstorming, 2.0 is think different, 3.0 is work different, and then there's a magic one, which I'll come to. So everybody understands brainstorming? Everyone been in a brainstorming session? Hands up. Yep. Invented in 1953 by Alex Osborne. And it just works. Brainstorming works. You have to use it. Good facilitation. Follow the rules. Focus on topic. Everyone knows how to do it. It is one of the fundamental tools of innovation. It just works. Generates lots of ideas. 
Innovation 2.0 is the Steve Jobs era from about 1980 to um, 2000, 2010. And it is the most important period because that's when innovation really started to accelerate. And if you want to see a lovely Steve Jobs video, type in Steve Jobs, the lost interview into YouTube, watch it for about five minutes, then type in Steve Jobs launching the iPad or the iPod and watch it and see the difference in the two presenters. And that is a microchasm of your career because there's a 20 year difference between the lost interview and the iPod launch and you'll see how the guy changed. In the lost interview, he had long hair, wore a suit and mumbled. In the iPod launch, he was the dude. <laughs> True? It took him 20 years to get there. And people forget that. People say, oh, well, I want to be an innovator and I want to do this and I'm going to be fantastic and I'll do it tomorrow. It took Steve Jobs 20 years to do it. And he was a genius. How long does it take other people to do it? In the lost interview, he tells a lovely story. And this is a story that's changed my whole way of thinking. He said, he was, when he was younger, he was reading a magazine, a nature magazine. There was a, 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 an article in there about how well um, species convert, convert food to locomotion, how efficient different species are. And this is the South American condor is the most efficient species on the planet. It takes the least amount of food to go the furthest. And I love this photograph because you notice the numbers on the wings. Somebody caught that bird, which is about eight foot wide, caught it, put numbers on it, let it go. That's one smart, one brave person. The human being, us, are three quarters of the way down the list of the most efficient people, efficient species to convert food to locomotion. Okay? Except when we get on a bicycle. When we get on a bicycle, we become the most efficient species on the planet to convert food to locomotion. And Steve Jobs in the interview said he has dedicated himself to building bicycles. He just happened to call them computers that happened to make people more productive. Innovation 2.0, Think Different, is all about tools. It's all about techniques. It's when design thinking was invented. I ride a bicycle, and I'm a pretty hopeless bicycle rider. It's just that I can ride a lot faster and a lot further than you guys can run because I've got a bicycle, because I've got a tool. If you want to become a better innovator, use tools. If you are not the most creative person on the planet, use tools. They work. Which one works for you? Yeah, it's a good question. I can't predict, and, we, and I spend a lot of my time working with organisations building toolkits and giving them toolkits that they can actually use. You need tools to improve. It just works. And I'm going to give you now the best tool that I've ever seen work in all areas of innovation. Just write this one down. <laughs> this is audience participation time. Why is a cappuccino the best tool of innovation? Number one, it's a stimulant. Number two? What do you mean by networking? You're talking to somebody else usually. You're gaining, gaining insights from that person. And you're gaining insights from that person, correct. Over here. <laughs> yes. Why else? So what's another reason? Come on. You get off your ass and you go somewhere else and you normally think different when you're somewhere else. Okay? It's also time limited. You have a cup of coffee, 12, 15 minutes, done, over, move on. All right, you don't do it forever. You might have more than one though, okay? And if you have a cup of coffee with a chocolate bar or a chocolate muffin, man, you are the most creative, okay? <laughs> Networking, collaboration is the tool that works every single time. Talking to other people, whether they're smarter than you or not, works every single time. The lovely formula that a cappuccino gives you is one plus one equals three. Works every time. So my theory is innovation 3.0 called work different. I'm going to share that with you in a second. Um, and it's my theory and you're allowed to criticise it and I'll get mortally wounded if you criticise it and I'll get really upset. Um, but I'm prepared to share it with you anyway. 
what's the magic other one though? There were four, um, four jigsaw pieces at the start. The other one I call Innovation 0.0. Innovation 0.0 started at the First World War in Australia. And it was actually recorded by Charles Bean, the famous war reporter, when he wrote in 1918, Australians did what they did in this war, not by refusing to learn from other countries, but by going out and picking up the very best that other countries would give them. Now, it's an incredibly sad thing that 50,000 Australians went overseas in World War I and only 40,000 came back. And we should always remember that. But 40,000 came back. And 40,000 learned an awful lot from overseas. And they started an awful lot of businesses, an awful lot of industries, and they created the nation. Because up until the First World War, it was migrants coming in, bringing the knowledge with them. At the First World War, we sent the best men and women of the country overseas, they learned and they came back. And that's in there's lots of case studies and lots of um, examples I can give you of where lots of today's businesses started at the people coming back from the First World War. And that's 100 years ago. The reason I call it Innovation 0.0 is it's about leadership. It's about strategy. Are you prepared to follow your leader out of the trenches like they did at Gallipoli? That's what Innovation 0.0 is. And when I go and interview the most innovative organisations in the country and I talk to their CEOs and then I talk to their staff who work for their CEOs, they will follow them out of the trenches because they've got great strategies, they're great leaders, they've got a vision and they're working really hard to actually achieve something. And that's what, so Innovation 0.0 starts with strategy goals and leadership. So how do we create success? This is innovation 3.0, my theory. So let's just compare these two guys, Microsoft versus Apple. The new boy on the block at the time was Apple, the, the traditional guy to help people and business throughout the world realise their full potential. This is the share price, and I just want you to look at the share prices between 2000 and 2011, when exponential growth really kicked in, okay? Humongous difference. Apple started off as a much smaller company, ended up as the world's most valuable company. Not the most biggest, most valuable. In that period, between 2000 and 2010, Microsoft spent 15% of its revenue on R&D, and Apple spent about 6%. Microsoft was a bigger organisation with bigger sales, and it spent three times as much money. You can't buy innovation. You don't have to have innovation. And this was the comment both John had and the previous speaker had, was that constraints and not having resources is the driver of innovation. This graph, when I showed it to the leadership team of ComBank, scared the pants off them. Because that graph says that any startup with a bright idea in banking can eat ComBank's lunch. True? Just because you're big and rich doesn't mean you're going to be successful going forward. Conversely, if you have no money, it's a great time to be innovative because <coughs> Apple didn't have any money and you don't need money. What you need is culture because culture eats strategy for breakfast. And innovation 3.0 is all about you. That's what makes the difference. So we've gone from the industrial revolution, the computer revolution, the internet revolution, the information revolution, now we're in the participation revolution and I congratulate everyone here who can both listen to me and tweet at the same time because man, I can't do it. <laughs> Everybody in the world's got the same computer power, it's got the same information. The only difference between major corporates in Australia and overseas is the people. The major difference between our competitors is the people. And Innovation 3.0 is all about you and how you collaborate and work together. And so when I say that, people go, yeah, right, prove it. So I'll prove it. It's called connectedness. And this is a chart, and I'm sorry, I'll read the names out, it's a bit small. We went and graphed and plotted every Australian publicly listed company, every director on every Australian publicly listed company, and whether a director was on more than one or two publicly listed companies. And if a director was on two public listed company, that's one level of connectedness, because that director obviously connects those two companies together. So in the middle there, you've got Westpac Bank, and you can just see the, down to the, about four o'clock, you've got Gail Kelly as the director of Westpac Bank. And you come down here, you've got um, Gordon, no, Elizabeth Bryan here, she's a director of Westpac Bank and Caltex, and she has a connectedness of one. 
Everyone understand that? 10,000 directors on Australian public listed companies, we um, got the information for a lot of them. And then we said, how well does connectedness drive performance? So across the bottom, we have the number of interlocks between boards. And we, up the side there, it's a cumulative annual growth rate and revenue. And what that says is that if you are not connected, you're a poor performer. If you're optimally connected, you're a best performer. And if you're over-connected, you're a poor performer. And all these figures have been done by people smarter than me, and they've all been statistically validated, so trust me. <laughs> why? I can understand why not being connected. I can understand why being optimally connected. The reason why poor performance drops off being overly connected is because you spend all your time being connected and not enough time doing your job. You spend too much time having cups of coffee. You spend too much time doing innovation, not doing your day job. And there's a lot of theory behind it. The most successful innovators in large corporates only spend two hours a week on it. Two hours a week is the optimal number in a large corporate to be a successful innovative person because you still have to do your day job. Are you waving to me or am I just spending? Correct. So are you a doer or a talker? Yes. Uh, everyone here a doer or a talker? It's only two hours a week though. If you give everyone in your organisation two hours a week, that makes a significant difference. You don't need everyone to be innovative all the time. So entrepreneurs and innovators are no smarter, no more courageous, tenacious or rebellious than the rest of us. They're just better connected. It's not about how smart you are. It's, about, it's not about what you know, sorry. It's about who you know. And if you're not the most creative person in the planet, make sure you have cups of coffee with people who are. And if you've got a problem, you can probably solve it with a cup of coffee rather than sitting there trying to do a mind map. And it's not about hierarchy. It's about the personality of the person. We can actually map them, and there's mapping techniques in large organisations where you can map and understand this. So on this particular chart here, and sorry for the colours, this is a large Australian organisation that happens to fly aeroplanes with red tails, but it's confidential. There are three divisions on there. There's a yellow division, an orange division, and a brown division. Okay. We ask everybody in those divisions of 900 people a, a one question, and then we plotted their responses and came up with that graph. What does that graph, what does that picture tell you? There's a divide, isn't there? There's something different between the yellow mob and the other mob. What we asked was, and this is the killer question of Innovation 3.0, and you should be able to answer this question after the workshop today. If you're faced with a problem or an opportunity at work and you need to ask someone for help, who would you ask outside of your boss and your direct team? Who would you ask outside of your boss and your direct team? If you can write down lists and we do a survey and there's a question and you press the button and up comes the telephone book and you pick the names of the people, write down those people because those people are the catalysts or the connectors or the agents, as we said before, I think. They are the most important people. Now, in this particular chart, the large orange one represents a person that 50 people nominated and said, we go speak to him. It was actually a her, by the way. We go speak to her. That person doesn't even need to fill in the survey, do they? The other 50 people say, that person's important because we ask their advice. And the smaller the circle, the smaller the number of people who, who highlighted it, pick those particular people. So when we came to solve this problem, what did we do? We just got, uh, we ran a brainstorming session, Innovation 1.0. We got all the people in the room that had big dots because they were the brains trust of the organisation. They are the people that everybody listens to. And we asked them how to solve it. And they came up with the solutions because everyone in the organisation listens to them. So what we've come up with is four roles of people. We have the leaders, and we've heard a lot about leaders today. We have the innovators, and we understand what innovators are. And then we have two other roles. One is what we call the catalyst, and the catalyst is the person that helps the innovator. They're the person that connects, they're the person that organises, they're the person that says, oh, have you tried this, oh, why don't you go speak to so-and-so, etc. They are the big lumps on that last diagram. And then we have the supporter. 
support of, is the person that helps the project, but it's not the innovator, not the leader, not the catalyst. And they are the most important people. In an organisation, we estimate that 90% of an organisation are supporters. The other 10% are the leaders, the innovators and the catalysts. And so this theory of making everybody in the organisation innovative is wrong. What you want is everyone in the organisation to understand their role, understand what they want to do, understand what their goals are. Some people love supporting other people's projects and they just not happen to be innovative, they're too busy, they're doing something else, etc. How many people here follow a sports team? Hands up. How many people here are supporters of a sports team? Right. Without you guys, the sports team wouldn't exist. You wouldn't buy the tickets, you wouldn't buy the shirts, you wouldn't buy the things, you wouldn't go and talk about it. Without the supporters, innovation doesn't exist. And they're the most important people in an organisation. So Innovation 3.0 says we have leaders and we have to make sure the leaders have the commitment of um, like a Gallipoli type commitment. Yes, we have innovators and there's lots of theories around that. And we have to identify, promote, help, work with the catalysts. And finally, you have to understand the supporters. No. No. So where do they fit in? Outside. <laughs> I don't listen to naysayers. Sorry, what was that? I don't. <laughs> I'm listening to. There's two types of naysayers. There's a naysayer that's a helpful naysayer. Mate, if you go out there, you're going to get hit by a car. That's good. You love those people. Black hat people tell you the truth, you're going to get hurt. The people I don't like are the critics who just bitch and complain and don't add any value. And I just personally stay away from them. And in an innovative organisation, you just let them alone because sooner or later they'll leave because they haven't got a happy life. However, as long as they don't upset other people, cool. Some people are just so busy and they've got kids at home, they're doing a part-time course and they've got this, renovating the house, etc., that they can't get involved in the whole thing, right? But as long as they're not negative, okay? So there are good and bad naysayers. My recommendation is if you've got an naysayer that's just plain negative, leave them out, go around them. Don't say, oh, so-and-so, we've got to bring them into the room, we've got to get them involved. No, nah, bugger them. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, because you haven't got time, have you? Um, you know what a catalyst is, it accelerates a reaction, is not consumed by it. Catalysts don't do the innovation for the innovators. They help the innovators get the innovation done, they don't do it. So how do we develop a strategy for success? And this is a quiz. If you've got a pen and paper, um, you need to pull it out now. If you've got a magical device, you need to put three, four numbers in a device. I'm going to ask you four questions. And I started late so I can finish late. I just checked the watch. I'm going to ask you four questions. The scale is one to five. Five is you're incredibly confident. Yes, you're right, you're happy. One is you're not. So the scale is one to five. Question number one. How confident are you that your organisation has got the strategy, has got the leadership, has got the goals to be successful through innovation? On a scale of one to five, give yourself a score. Are you, are you going to follow your organisation out of the trenches? That's a five. If you're going, oh, I'm looking for a job, that's a one. Give your organisation a score of innovation 0.0, strategy and goals. How confident you are that you are following, that you're happy that the organisation's got it right. Give yourself a score. Second number, are we doing things right? Brainstorming, small change, incremental, just doing the day-to-day -day stuff right. How happy are you that your organisation is just doing the little things right? You know how what you do, and the organisation's ticking, yeah, great. Five means you are good, one means you're not. How happy, confident you are that your organisation is just doing all the little things right? Give yourself a score. Third number. Are we doing the right things? How confident are you that your organisation is going forward, has got the right strategies in place, and is actually doing them? Not having the strategies, actually doing things, trying things, moving forward, doing the, not the big steps, but the bigger steps. How confident are you that your organisation is right? Okay. And, oh, sorry, that was the last question. I, I should have gone around the bottom, I apologise. <laughs> then the last one is, um, how happy are you that your organisation's got the tools in place, the skills, the people, the training, and all those sorts of things, so that everybody in your organisation can deliver the best of their capability? Everybody delivers the best of their capability. Doesn't mean they're all Steve Jobses. They are delivering the best of their capability. Give yourself a score. 
Now you've got four numbers and you have to work out a score for the total. And the secret is you have to multiply the numbers together, not add them up. Okay? Multiply the numbers together. The winning score is 625. 81 is average. That's 3 times 3 times 3 times 3. Look at your score. Remember, exponential growth goes like that. 5 times 5 times 5 times 5 is up there. 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 is 16 down here. That's the difference in the organisation. And for an organisation to be successful, you have to get all four right. Okay? So have a think about the way you scored your own um, organisation. So the question I want to ask you, though, is to wrap it up, is every organisation has goals of innovation. Do you want to get better, broader, bigger or bolder? Do you want to do different things or do it with different stakeholders? There's two approaches. There's the people first productivity approach, getting everybody involved, and then there's the dramatic approach. The fundamental difference between the public sector and the private sector is the private sector has a CEO that runs an organisation with a board and they determine how much productivity bottom up they do and how much change top down they do, what are the two different approaches and what they do. The difference with the public sector is you happen to have a minister and a political agenda and that comes from this side up here and you guys are down in that side over there and sometimes you guys get things that you have to do that comes from externally that is very specific, it's about new opinions that come from the minister or from the, the government of the day that imposes on your department that doesn't happen inside corporates because anything that happens inside corporates either comes from the CEO or comes from the competitor whereas you have a far more complicated system. And so when you look at the balanced innovation approach between bottom-up incremental innovation and top-down innovation in the public sector, in my opinion, sometimes you don't have a choice about doing top-down. Someone says you have to do it and you just have to do it because they said. All organisations that I deal with actually do both. They do bottom-up and top-down at the same time. And the more bottom-up you do, the more successful you are at top-down. So the last question, and I'm going to finish here, is I'm going to pass the post-it notes out with some volunteers who don't know that I've got them. I want you to write down two things. The first thing is, what's your insight from today? The second thing is this. The most powerful tool of innovation in corporates is a thing called the 10 types of innovation, and you would have heard it. <coughs> and what it says is, Innovation efforts have a path pathetic low hit rate because people only focus on product innovation. They only focus on the phone. They don't focus on the whole ecosystem from finance to delivery to customers to offering. And there's lots of different companies focusing on lots of different types of innovation. If you just look at product innovation, huge amounts of efforts with very low results. You know, making a better phone is not going to give you a lot. Whereas where the money is made is on how you do your business model or how you deal with your customers. And as an example, here's what Apple have done very well. It's not an iPhone, is it? It's a whole ecosystem around an iPod, around iTunes, around etc., etc. This is how Dell do it. They do it very well. What we're trying to determine is what are the 10 types of innovation that works in the public sector? What are the 10 areas of innovation that you should have on your agenda? Because you can't have products and services and branding and stuff like that. What are the 10 that you have? And so the thing that I'd like you to write on that post-it note, right? This number, so number one is your insight from today. Just write a sentence. Number two is we want to capture a real story of innovation that you guys are really, really proud of in your department that you've done something, no matter how big or how small, just write the story of innovation. You don't have to write your name on it. You can if you want. This is voluntary. What's the story of innovation? What's something that you want to share that we can then come up with a little thing that says these are the different types of innovation going on in the public sector? Does everybody understand the task? Now, I stretched a friendship with Abby because I'm the person between now and now it's time for a break. So you don't all have to get up and run out. We can have questions and then we can, um, you can do this. And there's a wall at the front here to stick your post-it notes on as you leave. And Abby has volunteered to theme them and get the results, etc. So I'm not going to take them away and do magic squirrel business with them. 
Um, Abby's going to get the lot of them. Um, and that's what um, I'd love you to do. So um, thank you very much. I hope you've learned something. And I'm here to have some questions, even though I am running. I started five minutes late. I can finish five minutes late. <laughs>